your turn. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so today, uh, so this talk is is you know slightly on the on the theoretical side. Um, so I'm going to merge the uh, the tutorial part with the sort of research part um, more continuously. I was told you know do some kind of research that's related to this. So I'll present a, a few examples uh, in the second half. But in the first half, I just wanted to go over uh, this this structured population modeling, which is you know kind of become popular also in in the math bio community. Uh, so this work has been done with you know the, some recent graduate students and postdocs that I've had here, and um, I'll list some of the papers at the end. Okay, so what I want to talk about are structured populations. That means uh, you have a population and it has some kind of attribute that's distributed continuously, right? So for example, um, this is used for demography in a population, basically age distribution of a population, let's say. Uh, other things that can age is let's say uh, disease incubation periods for SIR type models. So that's been used quite a bit in the last couple of years. Um, on a more microscopic scale, biophysics scale, cell age, for example, right? When a cell divides, it's not, um, it's not really a Markovian process. There's a cell clock involved. So there's a timing involved. So there's, in other words, there's an age involved. So this extends to cell size and cell added size as well after a cell is born. And there's other continuous attributes or age-related processes that uh, I might give a few examples of. So the outline of the talk will be a summary, uh, a review really of this classic McKendrick equation. Um, I'll do the basic derivation and the history and the, some of the features. And then I wanna present some research and this will sort of bleed into the second half uh, the applica one application is the one child policy. This is a historically kind of an interesting, at least to me, uh, story about China's one child policy and how this equation, the McKendrick equation came to play in that, uh, in that story. Then I will just give a brief um, setup for sizer, timer, adder, cell proliferation models and highlight a couple of sort of mathematically interesting results at least. And then if there's time, I want to extend this to a stochastic generalization of the McKendrick equation, which is a deterministic model, right? And I'll just show uh, how, what that leads to. And again, there's some interesting math mathematical uh, kinetic theory type problems there. So uh, this all started with demography, really. <clears throat> um, so the question is, let's say I wanted to model age-dependent rates of a population, right? So typically you write a, a growth equation, dn dt, n is a total population at time t, it's birth minus death times n. Um, so if this is large, if this is positive, it grows exponentially negative, it, it decays. But these can depend on time. But what we really want to describe is how, um, what are these rates dependent on age, right? So it's not the, uh, um, global time, it's the age, it's, it's the time since you were born. So for example, for the humans, uh, this is data uh, 2006 for the birth, 2017 for the death. This is the birth rate, right, for humans, right? You have some period of fecundity and then the death rate <laughs> increases um, in in, with age, right? Not in time. So these functions, uh, if, if you imagine the next axis coming out of the board, out of your screen, which is time, these don't change that much in time, right? Fairly constant. I mean, hopefully the death rate is going down with medical advances, et cetera, et cetera. So we really want to do, we want to describe this population in terms of the distribution of age. So, um, yeah. So one way, one obvious way you might think is, okay, let's put in windows, right? Data is often presented this way. Uh, what fraction of the population is between age zero and five, six and 10, et cetera, et cetera. So these are called Leslie matrices. They, they, it's a discrete uh, approach. And uh, for those of you who model uh, these kind of problems, you know that discrete approaches, so this is discrete in age, you bin it in age windows, and then discrete in time. Time and age have the same units. You, you really ought to treat them in the same way. 
Uh, discrete problems sometimes have other mathematical uh, side effects that you might not want. Um, so the question is, how do we track these ages continuously across both time and age? So obviously then uh, the population needs to be described in terms of some function that's a function of both age and time. Okay. And the, the basic physical feature, if you will, is that a total time derivative then is the partial with time and um, you're just using the chain rule, right? Mm -hmm. So you get the partial in time, partial in age, dA, dt. A is age. Let's say it's measured in the same units of time. Hello, sorry. Okay, never mind. So this would be one. Uh, yeah, ask any questions, by the way. Um, so I'm trying to go through this pedagogically, but all right. So where did this all start? <clears throat> this is actually a paper from 1926, the McKendrick uh, a paper in the proceedings of the Edinburgh Mathematical Society. Um, so he developed the, the, the the next slide or two is, is what he basically developed. Uh, von Forster also wrote similar equations for cell populations, right, in 1959, 30 some years afterwards. So it's typically called the McKendrick equation. And in physics, uh, following the physics tradition of naming something for someone who did it later is sometimes called the von Forster equation. Okay, so. Uh, Again, you want to describe a population via a function. Now we allow the birth and death rates to depend on age and time. So the derivation is, um, the, the, the more careful derivation is to define a cumulative population. So this is the total population with age between zero and A, right? So we integrate the, the population, the population density from zero to A. Then we want to, um, measure the birth and death rates of this population, of the total population. So the, uh, so the total population with age less than A. So the birth rate is the birth rate, which is a function of age, Y, times the population at that age integrated over all ages. Right? So this gives birth to newborns that contributes to the population that is the cumulative population between zero and A. The death rate, on the other hand, is, again, the death rate times the number of individuals in that age increment uh, integrated up to age A. So in the standard way, you just construct the change in the number when you increment time forward by H. Right? So you look at this cumulative population, and you look at it, you look at this quantity at time t and at time t plus h. So if you forward time, you forward age as well. Okay, so this, uh, uh, the difference is just this, okay? Birth minus death. Then you take h to zero, find your um, PD. So what you get is then, um, so you, you'll note that this definition of the cumulative, the partial derivative of this cumulative is simply uh, the density n at a, a, age a, right? Just taking a derivative of this with respect to a. So that's this term here, that's this term here. You have birth minus death. And you notice this equation, which is this, uh, uh, think of the, the, these two terms, right? This equation, it's birth minus death. The birth term does not depend on age. Right? The death term, because this is a cumulative, uh, has the upper limit dependent on age. So for typical problems like this, um, you take the derivative with respect to age, and you get this equation. Right? This term goes away because it doesn't depend on age. You take d by dA, you get this. Right? This is d by dT. This is partial and partial T. But if you take the derivative with respect to age, you, know, you get rid of this integral. All right, so this is the equation. And of course, the right-hand side doesn't have the birth, right? And why is that? Because this is the PDE. When you give birth, you give birth to age zero individuals, right? It does not contribute to uh, the density 
in the interior uh, uh, with finite a, right? So zero. So it turns out to, to find the boundary condition. Um, so you think of this as like, like a functional, which, which you can take derivatives of to generate the PDE, the classical P and the boundary conditions, right? This, this includes the boundary conditions because it's an integral equation. So if you set A to zero, this term goes away because you're integrating from zero to zero. This term goes away. You just get birth um, uh, at age equals zero. And that's, um, that's this term, right? So it's B. All right, B of T, B of T, remember, was, was, was this. Uh, or, or it, it came from, from that term. So now you have a boundary condition. This says that the births of all at age A is weighted by their birth rate over all ages. That generates the uh, population density of newborns. And then you have to specify an initial condition, right? Let's say at t equals zero, what is my population? Like today, t equals zero today, what is my population distribution, age distribution? Let's say that's given. Okay, so this is a uh, PD with a classical solution, but um, the boundary condition is, you know, it's kind of weird, right? It's kind of a strange, you've got the boundary, it depends on itself and it's, it's, it's an integral over itself. Um, so just a couple of comments. It's linear. It's still linear, right? So no interactions. So far, we have not included in any interactions. This is simply a generalization of, uh, of standard birth death. Uh, another thing to note, um, uh, yeah, since this, I define this cumulative or the total in this case as the integral, Na is really the density. So meaning Na of T dA is the expected number in this population with age between A and A plus dA, right? So, so N, little n is actually density. So it has units, is units of number per time or per age. Something to note, it's not a probability density. Um, towards the end of, of my second talk, I'll, I'll You'll, you'll see more clearly why. Um, and the birth and death rates are still the same, right? They're still uh, per unit time. Okay, so this equation, this is the, again, this is the McKendrick or von Forster equation. I, I, I use it both to pay deference to the physics people here. Um, this can be formally solved using method of characteristics, right? Remember, we had an initial condition defined as G of A. That's my initial distribution. If I plot uh, in phase space here, age and time, there's a distribution at, at time equals zero. And as time moves forward, the age is moved forward too. So think of each of these lines as a trajectory of one individual that you sample, All right? So you can fill out this space, you basically know the solution, how it evolves from the point here, the initial condition, and how it moves along each of these lines. So imagine now putting infinite number of these lines here, these trajectories, um, to construct the solution. And the solution here along one of these lines depends on the position at uh, zero here, right, at this point, which is given. So this is boundary data that gives you this sector uh, of the solution. But then, of course, we so so just following method of characteristics, it's just this thing, right? G, N of A T for A greater than T, that's this region, is just G of A minus T times this exponential of the decay. So this is death, remember? So this is exponentially decaying. So you start with a person here, you move forward in time, they're going to exponentially decay, right? This is called a cohort in cohort studies. You pick, you pick some individual here and you track them. Now, what makes this problem interesting is, of course, there's birth. <clears throat> Along the life trajectory of each of these, right, one can give birth. And the birth here is budding birth. Um, let me see. There's, uh, there, there's budding birth. So that means uh, when the mother here gives birth, uh, they continue along their trajectory. And then they, 
generate a newborn at this density. Sorry, that should be an N. I've been, I switched notation. That should be an N instead of rho. It's the population density um, at age zero, right? So what you're doing is you're taking the solution, the cohort, the initial cohort, it's generating the boundary condition uh, that describes birth. So once you give birth, then these newborns start um, uh, aging as well. And then these can give birth, right? So you're constantly feeding this boundary and generating the boundary condition that uh, that allows you to propagate forward. This is you know, a very typical behavior of the uh, hyperbolic type uh, uh, PDEs. And, and this is easily implemented numerically. Okay. So, um, okay. Now we have nonlinearities we haven't discussed, right? So, uh, for example, um, carrying capacity, right? Where you have the birth or the death depend on the total number. So then you would have to put the birth. So this has the birth in it, this, this equation here, right? Um, this is again, the solution from method of characteristics. This is the death. These can now depend on total N of T. And then you have to solve the problem self-consistently. And that's also um, doable with the uh, forward time stepping, very relatively simple um, approach. So one could include that in, but it has to be numeric to get the age distribution. Okay, so let me see if I should skip this. Okay, anyway, if I take now, uh, so you know, every time you do this, you should check, right? Let's say the birth rate and the death rate we have here, let's say they were independent of age. Let's say that you know we, we do our standard thing, which just depends on time. You can actually integrate this equation to find the total population, right? Here, the total population. And at the end of the day, you get back what we what we would guess, right? The simple simple case. Okay, um, so that's that's just a check. Now, there's a couple of, there's additional things, uh, little features that I want to mention about this equation. Um, uh, so let's say they were time dependent. Now, let's say the death rate was time dependent, the time independent. You can write the survival fraction, right? It's it's Again, not really probability, but uh, the survival fraction. Think of it as a survival probability of an individual or the fraction of individuals who start at age A and survive up to age B, right? So that's just this term. And the solutions, in fact, uh, in the upper, in the, in the A greater than T and A less than T, the method of characteristic solutions can be written completely in terms of the survival probability. Right, compactly written in terms of survival. Right, survival is simply uh, going along each trajectory. How much of how much exists? Right, how many of these infinite number of lines uh, haven't died yet? Um, so, all right, that's one feature. Um, another feature is uh, the steady state age distribution. Okay. So at long times, right? At long times, there's still there's still growth, either positive or negative growth. One can find the largest eigenvalue, lambda, and decompose this this function as a steady state age distribution times this exponential factor. Right? So if we put that, we take this form, substitute it into the solution. Um, for, for, for t greater than a, let's say, right? We've gone off, so we've gone off to the right-hand side, we're here now. We're looking at the age distribution along this vertical line way out at, at long times, okay? So that, uh, after a little bit of manipulation is just this equation, right? It is basically, uh, it's, it's basically when the Laplace transform equals one of this quantity of, of, of birth times uh, survival. So this is a self-consistent way to numerically find this eigenvalue lambda. Okay? And we'll use this in one of the applications of it. Uh, so in the, at the end of the day, your steady state distribution at long times 
is proportional to either the minus lambda a, which you find from this equation, times the survival, right? And survival is also decreasing because it has that e to the minus death term, right? So this says that in this type of model where lambda is positive, if lambda were positive, right? Uh, that means you have growth. Total population is growing exponentially. The age distribution is monotonically decreasing always. So there's always more young people than old, always, right? For this non-interacting uh, model. So again, we'll give an example where that's not the case later on. Uh, yeah, and, and of course you can define all the other th from things that you're familiar with, R0, right? The, um, the infectious, the, the, the infection number, the reproductive number, right? It's, it's birth. It's, it's the average number of offspring an individual has over a lifetime. So that's the birth rate times its survival integrated over all age. You can define the average age, sorry, let's draw up. You can define the average age by this, right? Average age of reproduction. Generation time, T, is defined by this. So all the standard quantities that, uh, that you know and love um, also comes out in this framework. Okay, so there's some applications and I'm gonna slowly shift um, uh, to the next part of the talk, if there are questions, let me go through the slide uh, first. Um, so again, the, this is just the, the basic derivation, 1926, right? I forgot to mention that that McKendrick guy, uh, let me, let's come back, this guy here, 1926, he was a, um, right, Lieutenant Colonel in the British Army, and he was dispatched to India, and I guess they were doing public health type of stuff. Right, so the, the British have a long tradition of their military doing all sorts of things. Um, so he was interested in demography. And the guy wrote about 60 papers in his lifetime. There's another McKendrick uh, equation, Kermack McKendrick equation, that's also quite famous. So uh, anyway, this, I would say his paper from 1926 was kind of underutilized for a number of years. It's gaining some popularity now. Uh, but it's it's in my opinion it's one of the the you know papers that are cited less than it should be uh, one of the you know, most underappreciated papers. Okay, so applications, right? As I mentioned, structured population. You can consider incubation periods, right? There's let's say infected that are asymptomatic and they go become symptomatic, and there's data on that. Right? There's a sort of a time scale. So there's a rate of symptoms um, taking effect, right? That's kind of like our, our birth rate, for example. Um, other more sort of biophysics problems, uh, cell, blood cell aging, right? Development of during hematopoiesis, um, the cells are developing, but they're, there's a time involved, involved, right? There's a stem cell regeneration, stem cell. Uh, uh, differentiation rate that's not Markovian. Even uh, the simple red blood cells in humans, in in most animals, it's more or less Markovian. But in humans, uh, I think in in pigs maybe too, um, they have a lifetime, right? And I think this is like one standard deviation: 120 days plus or minus three. This comes presumably from um, degradation of the cytoskeleton band A proteins, and they degrade up to a certain point, and then their mechanical properties change, and the spleen clears them out after 120 days. So this, again, this is also an, an, an aging problem. And you're generating new blood, uh, red blood cells all the time, right? But in this case, red blood cells aren't dividing, so it's not birth, but it's an immigration, rather, right? So the equations that, I, that I've showed, um, you can include immigration as well at age zero. Right, newly born red blood cells. Uh, this model has been also applied to aging, uh, the, the density of cell adhesion linkages and cells on surfaces and things like that. So the, this just sort of gives you a, a, a nice um, overview of what this kind of equations can be used for. Uh, what I wanna present is some results on, again, I, as I mentioned, the, the, the China one child policy. And I'll briefly go over some sizer, uh, sizer timer adder models. 
Um, and then this, if there, uh, hopefully there's time, this is really, really what I want to get into for, for those of you more uh, theoretically minded, the, the kinetic theory. Uh, let me see, should I, should we take a, a break for questions now? If there's any questions? Pretty clear, all right, I got, tried to keep it simple. Um, hopefully you follow, um, but you know, these slides will be online, I guess. This, this derivation. This derivation is not not that easy to find. It's not, it's not in the textbooks. Um, it's in some some textbooks, but not not all. Um, chat. Any questions? Does it matter if there are multiple offspring? Yes. So multiple offspring. Uh, uh, that birth term, I would just put a two or a three in front there. That is birth at the same time. That's like giving a twin, giving birth to a twin. The other difference is for cells, when the mother divides, typically it's thought that you're giving two daughters. So both of them would be at age zero, right? And then the original trajectory that the mother was on vanishes. So that is again in the kinetic theory, which I'll cover later, hopefully, and that, that'll become much more clear. Okay, so this is the story. Uh, so we got into this, I mean, this was, I guess during COVID and we were just, you know, twiddling our thumbs, thinking of something to do. Um, actually, it started before. So the China's one-child policy, we were kind of I, some, I don't know, if I was reading or something. Um, it came, it, it was started by this guy named um, uh, uh, Song. I, I forgot. I think, I think, I think Song is his last name, Jian, Jian Song. Um, so he was one of the old school uh, Soviet trained control theory, applied math type people. Uh, so he went to a conference sometime in 90, 1978, Club of Rome, those of you who know, um, you know, they were talking about population control. So he used this exact equation, the McKendrick equation that I described, okay? And what he did was use this R0, right, which I previous, previously defined here as the control variable and use uh, control theory on this, uh, the McKendrick equation. And this is like a cutout from a, one of these old papers. And this is 1 billion, 1980. And if they had kept going, so this is the shocking thing, right? So he says, okay, this is the, the, well, okay, the beta is not my beta. His beta here is this control variable R0. And he, if he kept that at whatever it was in 1980, predicted a population in 2080 or something of four and a half billion. So this was kind of uh, shocking. And uh, this really pushed the leaders apparently, according to this book, which is, it's a, this is someone's thesis, I guess. Uh, this was, shocking and of course there was actually some this book details there was some internal debate by demographers sociologists whatever you know that, that this isn't the way to go this is what the target they wanted to target 750 million or 600 million something like that in 100 years that was the idea and it showed that you had to have r0 basically be one right or even less um so this was his projection using uh, uh control theory so we decided, uh, you know, so we're sort of practicing on this equation, thinking what, what kind of interesting things we can say. Uh, so we had an idea to do like a retrospective analysis. Um, so what we wanted to do is say, okay, instead of saying uh, you're only allowed one child, suppose you're allowed any number, but you need to wait a refractory period. You need to wait after the birth of one child a certain number of years before you can have a second child, right? So this would be a softer control, if you will. Um, so now you have to extend the uh, dimensionality of the problem. There's age, there's time, and then you need another variable to keep track of um, the time between births, right? For, for cell models, this would be like the adder. So you need to track uh, the refractory period. So you 
would decompose the population into females that have not given birth yet, F0, and those who have given birth. Those who have given birth would, would depend on this tau, right? The, the density of females would, would depend on this tau. So in this case, this population, those who are given birth, this F is actually a double density. It's a density in A and in time, remember, right? So, um, so you have two, uh, two functions with different units, really, the different densities. Um, and you can construct uh, all sorts of quantities. This would be the boundary condition for these. And then this is the boundary condition at the tau equals zero, right? So this is number of females, uh, uh, density of females at tau equals zero. That means, you know, uh, they had just given birth, right? Uh, and then this is... Um, this is anyone given birth, giving birth, right? Beta, so th there's a beta naught for those who haven't given birth and a beta. Now this beta also depends on tau and this will be our control. Okay, so once you give birth, uh, you give birth to someone who hasn't given birth before, right? The newborn hasn't given birth. So this is the boundary condition at A equals zero. Eta here is the male-female sex ratio, which is about 0.48 for China. Um, we can do the same thing, find the steady state distribution, right? Call it H this time, eigenvalues. Uh, plug that in, you get the eigenvalue equations with boundary conditions and a self-consistent equation for the eigenvalue lambda as before. Um, you can define this effective birth rate, which is the uh, in terms of the both these birth, right? We have two different birth rates. You can relate both of these to a effective birth rate, which is the birth rate for the total population, okay? Uh, th basically, this is what's measured in data, and we need to reconstruct this. So there's a little bit of sort of mathematical uh, uh, playing around. Um, so our results, um, kind, of, kind of interesting. So suppose now that the birth rate that you impose is the, uh, virgin birth rate times this cutoff, right? So this birth rate has got to be zero if uh, the tau is less than delta. And delta is the delay you must wait before you have another child, okay? Well, we'll let you have another child, but you need to wait delta. So the eigenvalue, right, as a function of this delay delta, it turns out, and, and these are using real numbers, right? So this is the positive growth. Uh, if you do nothing. The one child limit is here, right? That's an infinite delta. You need to wait infinite times before you can have another child. So you, you, you basically don't. So the sharpest decrease is at short times, two, three years, right? So after, if you impose a delta of three years, four years, you can get the growth rate negative. And you, you, you suffer, the eigenvalue suffers the greatest decrease at small deltas. So that's good news, right? For this hypothetical policy. Uh, the other feature is that the asymptotic steady, the steady state age distribution is no longer monotonically decreasing, right? So if the one child policy is up here, right? Infinite delay time, that gives you this peak, which is senior, right? Peak around seniors, which, you know, presumably has socioeconomic implications. So, uh, uh, so putting a, increasing the delta, you get more and more seniors, but you can still have a good, um, you know, a, a quote unquote good distribution without having a peak at, at the elderly age here. By the way, this, uh, this distribution has been normalized, right? It's it, the total population is not reflected. This is just the shape of this, of the distribution, right? Because Lambda could be positive or negative. So the total area could be growing or, or shrinking. This is just the asymptotic uh, shape of the total population. Um, so we use uh, data, and as I mentioned, we can separate. So the data from China in 1980, that's actually published. Um, the dotted line is the total initial condition. So I is the initial condition. So the dotted line is that initial condition. But with our model, 
and the predict assuming things were did not change in time, which they did, right? Granted, things change in time, the culture, the, the economics change and whatnot. Uh, but if nothing changed in time, we can self-consistently within this model separate out this total initial population, female population, age distribution, right? That's from their census data. We can separate it out into those who have not given birth and those who have given birth, right? That's the blue and the red added together gives you the dotted. So with these numbers, then we can project forward from 1980. This is what happened. This is our prediction, assuming nothing else changed, right? Which is, you know, obviously unrealistic. But again, here you see, this is the total population. And then this is uh, a delta for these curves in two-year increments. So you see again, that the adding an increment at low delta here brings the quickest decrease in the total population, right? And then any more has uh, a saturated effect, right? It's, it's uh, um, diminishing returns if I increase this delta even more. So this is a one-child policy here, this red line, right? So one could have said, okay, you gotta wait 10 years and, you're, and you'd be down here already, right? If you waited 10 years, you'd, you'd be somewhere around here. I mean, 10 years, uh, yeah. I mean, if you make it any longer then the then the person's fecundity window is, is shot anyway, right? But at least this is, you know, maybe a, a, a politically more palatable <laughs> uh, control. Um, but anyway, this short short would have some impact anyway. Um, and then, so they they played around with this, believe it or not. And there, there is some literature on this. Um, one can impose something like a minimum birth age. Okay. So you can't have a child until you're 26 or something, right? Until you're mature enough in other ways or something, right? So, uh, so we can impose both policies. And this plot just shows that um, whatever you impose, you're gonna get more seniors, right? This is the line of 20% seniors. It's a senior population fraction. Um, you know, it'll always increase. And in fact, it, it increases more when you do this minimum age, uh, 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 constraint. So an interesting feature is if you if you're up here, if you have a long birth delay or the one child policy, let's say you have the one child policy and you increase the minimum age that you can be before having a child. All right, that's here. So if I if I make the minimum age of having a child very high, of course, the population goes down, right? This is the, oh, sorry, this is the growth rate, actually. So it goes down. But in this regime, it actually goes up. Okay, so I'm under the one-child policy. Now I additionally say that you can't have a child until you're 25, 28. The growth rate actually goes up, right? As counterintuitive. Um, any idea why? So if you um, increase, okay, so think of it this way. If you decrease the minimum age and you're on the one child policy. So if you're on the one child policy, after any gener every generation, the population goes down by half, right? M roughly, right? So sort of think physically, right? Uh, Every generation, you're only allowed to have one child, right? Two people gave birth to one child. So you cut, so your population is going down one over two to the N, where N is the number of generations that have, have elapsed. So if I decrease my minimum age, I'm decreasing the period of a generation. I'm making one each generation. Um, I mean, of course, all the generations are overlapping, right? So I'm just doing a, a back of the envelope. So if I make the age, minimum age smaller and people are having children at, the, at a lower age, each generation is faster, right? A, a generation is a shorter amount of time. And this is the asymptotic growth rate. This is the long time growth rate. So in fact, you get this uh, non-monotonic behavior. So, Again, this is sort of like a, a, a cautionary tale, right? Instead of just doing whatever policies, you, you could make things worse, right? 
Okay, so let me see what time I have. Okay, so let me briefly go through this. I think some of you are maybe more, more familiar with this. Um, so the adder, sizer, timer models, as I mentioned, um, uh, cells, right? Uh, division of cells is sort of a complicated signaling process, but, uh, but it's typically projected into three different types of variables, and that's the time, the size, or the added size, right? So this is in time, let's say, after some amount of time, I have some mechanism in the cells that just said, okay, this amount of time is elapsed, so I'm gonna divide. So this cell grows, this is, let's say, cell volume, right? Or size, it's growing. And then within this time window, it divides in two, and then it divides in four. And so you have this, or you could have the control on this axis, volume, right? When the cell divides, I'm uh, sorry, when the cell grows and it reaches some kind of uh, a window of volume, then it divides. And when it divides, it could be asymmetric like this. So then, then they start growing and then they divide when they're uh, within this volume. Or you could use added size. You count the size change after birth and use that as the control. Um, so there's kind of evidence for all of this, right? That this is the first one, the cell cell cycle, a clock, um, cell size, it, you know, if it's presumably if it's resource limited. And then recent evidence shows that there's also uh, potential added volume. So all of these, now the continuous variable, right? Could be age or it could be volume or added volume. And so the equations, okay, so let me just, uh, so this is this part is a little, little tutorial-like, right? Uh, let's see, the Fibonacci sequence is a special case where the discrete case is known. Is it consistent with the metric equation? No, I don't see, I don't see, maybe I don't understand the question. It's the birth rate of, uh, Tom, it's the birth rate of like rabbits, which uh, divide every generation. And then you look at the numbers and you get the Fibonacci sequence for the number of rabbits. Never oh. mind. Oh, okay, okay. That seems to imply some kind of, uh, no, it doesn't have to be interacting. I don't know, I don't know, good. Let me, let me look, <laughs> I'll definitely look that up. Um, uh, where are we? Okay, so this is, actually this is your question, Robin, was, was something related to this, right? So now, if it's a timer model in a cell divides, I do have the birth term on the right, right? And it's minus, why? Because when I give birth, I remove, because now the mother becomes two daughters, and the age of the mother no longer exists. So I remove the mother by giving birth, right? By the mother becoming two daughters and you get two daughters here, right? Uh, so this is a slight modification depending on whether it's a budding birth or fission birth, okay? And th this also has implications in the stochastic model I'll talk about in terms of uh, branching processes. Um, okay, so that's that would just be the timer model, which is, which is the close, most closely related to the McKendrick equation. Then there's the sizer, I can add different combinations. It doesn't have to be just one of these, right? I could have different combinations, timer, sizer, adder, sizer, timer. So that means the cell uses both of these as a control. That means the birth rate, division rate depends on both functions or functions of both age and size. And then there's the adder sizer model. Okay, now what's missing here? the adder timer model or the adder timer sizer model, right? That, that can't exist in the deterministic limit because adders, it's the, um, the added volume is, comp is not independent of the time, the age, right? In a deterministic growth model, right? The, these curves are deterministic. So uh, if I'm counting just added size, it's the same as uh, timer. So these are the possible combinations, at least in deterministic uh, PDE world. Um, so size or timer would be something like this, right? You have something that depends on age, age is the time, and then the birth, so the birth rate will, will depend on the age. It will depend on um, uh, uh, the size of the mother, right? X prime, but when it divides, it will divide into something that's uh, size Z prime. So now there's a differential division rate of something of size X into something of size Z and something of X minus Z. 
right? The, the assuming volume is conserved. The growth rate, this is the, ter the deterministic growth rate can depend both on age and size and time if you're changing conditions. And this is the, the growth rate law, right? This is size, time rate. Of, so this is deterministic. And this deterministic convection, what does it give you at the end? It gives you this type of equation. So this is the timer part. This is the size part and it's convecting. Now age, remember this was dA, dT and it was one because age and time were the same thing. But now size and time are not the same thing, right? Size and time are connected by the, the rule, the growth rate rule, G. So the G comes in like this, right? And, and I'm including no death here just to simplify things. And so this is actually minus the birth rate on the right-hand side and then with the boundary condition, okay? So this should be, this, this should, you know, given, given tutorial earlier, this should be uh, kind of uh, make sense, right? Um, and then uh, the adder sizer model as well, right? So you have the time, there's no age anymore, but there's size X and added size Y. And they both have the same growth rate because they're both size. Again, minus beta on the right-hand side. So there's a little bit of algebra deriving this, but it's derived in the same way as the cumulative, as the McKendrick derivation that I presented earlier. The boundary condition now is now has this growth in front of this, this N and then two for fission birth. Okay, so again, one can define many things like the total biomass, uh, the total population now, right? N is now double density, remember, in, in size and added size, double density, I integrated twice, I get total population. Total biomass is total mean biomass is X times N. The distribution of division events, so this can be, is something can be measured. Um, uh, you collect all the mothers that divide and you mark down their size and added size, right? And, and you can uh, generate a density of points. You can uh, find that as well. Yes, shock fronts. Um, uh, the, the, there, there is no shock fronts here. Typically, you need some kind of non-linearity. Everything is still linear here. Um, mean cell size. Now, this was interesting. We computed this. If there is no death, this for for very reasonable birth rates, this can diverge. So the distribution, the density, uh, it has no mean, right? At, at long times, it could actually diverge. So this implies that you actually need a death to maintain cell size distribution, you know, which is reasonable. But you need a certain form of death, right? With a certain form of birth, you you can have this blow up behavior in this kind of PDEs. Um, uh, another another interesting thing, which, which we've explored, it's all in this paper. Um, birth, so evolution. So where would evolution come in in this model, right? Okay, you can have things changing in time, but that's for the the, the particular cell, right? It's through the birth term. So suppose suppose the growth rate here, right? The growth rate is just lambda times x. So this is exponential growth, right? X dot equals lambda times x. I can have the lambda change every time I give birth. So in other words, I can have the daughters have a slightly different lambda than the mothers. And in fact, uh, typically what you want is that the, or what's reasonable is the daughters remember something of their mother. So the daughters will have, so this is daughter of generation I plus one, uh, the, the growth rate of I plus one generation is the ith generation with some correlation function plus some noise, right? So th there's a distribution function for lambda written here, right? It could be like log normal or something. So you can, you can put this convolution into the boundary condition, which says that every time you give birth, the daughters uh, will have a slightly shifted uh, uh, growth rate than the mothers. So evolution comes in through and you can put any kind of parameters you want here, right? Growth rate parameter or some, some other parameter, some other attribute. So you can uh, uh, keep track of, of how things are evolving through boundary condition. So that, um, let me see how much, okay, uh, maybe six minutes. Uh, so that's the story. This is some of the research based on the tutorial part. Um, and hopefully it's, it's you know, easier to follow.
with the tutorial part. I didn't want to throw any more um, equations, but this is just to, to, to you know, give you the overview of what, what, what we've done with, with, with these type of uh, framework. So going back to this, right? These are cells. And yes, a lot of these experiments are done in some very small systems, microfluidic, uh, mother machine type, type setups. So stochasticity could be uh, relevant, right? So where can stochasticity come in? Well, it can come in through the growth rate. That could be fluctuating. It could be a fluctuating quantity. But there's a birth death event. There are birth death events, discrete events, right? So that's demographic stochasticity um, in the numbers, right? Just finite numbers, basically. So, uh, so there's stochasticity in this, and th this you would, you know, probably put some kind of Brownian noise on top of this, right? Uh, on, on top of these convection terms here, have the Brownian noise here. So it's really multiplicative noise. Uh, because it multiplies the end here. Uh, or we can just look at demographic stochasticity. And, the, and this is the, the topic I want to uh, briefly overview for you. So how do you incorporate demographic stochasticity? Well, uh, you essentially use kinetic theory. Um, like for gas particles, right? You've got the, the velocity and the position of each particle, and then they collide. That's kinetic theory. So I can write down a age ordered, uh, uh, I can assume distinguishable individual and age order them. So now I have an N dimensional density. So F, this is the density of N particles. So this is, think of this as a, a sort of like a probability of having N particles where the youngest one is between age uh, X1 and X1 plus DX1. The second youngest is between age x2 and x2 plus dx2, and so on. Okay, so that's the we write it. So that's uh, density. Then I'm going to use the same 1926 <laughs> McKendrick, you know, derivation. Uh, define the cumulative, the ordered cumulative. Okay, for all these ages, I'm going to write the ages. So this is the number of individuals of the youngest one between age zero and a one. And the other one, the next one is between X1 and A2, um, right? So just this ladder of ages. And then, uh, so this is the, the cumulative density or, or probability at this point, because I'm integrating over all the ages. This is the age factor. Then I define an increment in time, just like before, what we call H, right? The method of characteristics. You, you forward time by some quantity epsilon, you get this equation. You just get the convection equation. The right-hand side has to be birth and death. Remember, birth minus death. So birth minus death is a little more complicated. Uh, anyway, we go through it. Uh, there are birth terms, death terms. Um, you'll notice that this is n-dimensional, right? Sum from i1 to n. The right-hand side, though, the death, involves terms from n plus 1. Right? Why is that? I have n plus one particles. One of them died. I go into the state where there's n particles left. So I start with n plus one. So this is now, you can see, is a hierarchy of equations in n. Okay, no problem. We can still write it down. It's simple. Oh, then I symmetrize it, right? Assuming the particles are independent, are, are indistinguishable. Uh, take the multiple derivatives, find the equations, find the boundary conditions. Now, the boundary conditions is, is a simplex in this higher dimensional problem, right? So hat means this age is missing. I give birth, and I generate this age at age zero. So it's a high dimensional simplex boundary condition, right? Just it, it, It's the same as in McKendrick. It's just higher in higher dimensional, right? Now, what can we do with this? This is not sort of practical to solve. Um, ah, let me just, uh, okay, we just got a couple minutes. Let me just... Give, give you the upshot. So this yeah. is just an so, example. Uh, sorry, uh, Tom. Let me just. Yeah, if you can wrap up, so we can have a few yeah. minutes. But, but yeah, yeah. Let me just let me let me just get like three more I'll flash. It. Okay, just an example of the. Okay, I'll, I'll skip this. This is it, right? This is the McKendrick equation solution at a fixed time. This is the distribution of H for a very simple constant beta process. The constant beta, no death, right? And these are simulations. This is distribution. So this is clearly a difference in the stochastic versus the deterministic, right? This is the the McKendrick mean result 
Okay, so what can we do with this? There's marginalization, right? I can integrate out all ages except for K of them. And you get this equation and you see what happens is you get a hierarchy in K as well as in N. So this is a double hierarchy and the implications for that means there's two ways of approaching um, uh, closure, this problem. So let me just say, um, so if I take the lowest order, I get this equation for, let's say I integrate out all ages, all of them. I just want to know the probability that I have n particles regardless of age. Well, it actually depends on the probability I have n particles or n minus one or n plus one with one age left, not integrated out because it's involved with the birth and death rates which depend on age. If the birth and death rates don't depend on age, you can take these out of the integral, integrate this row superscript one, it becomes a row superscript zero, and you just get the simple birth death master equation, right? Where beta and mu are independent of age. The other alternative is to play with the with the uh, um, uh, with the n, uh, sorry, with the with the k variable. Uh, uh, by setting k equal to one, uh, in the end of the day, we get the McKendrick equation with a age dependent death rate, sorry, with an n dependent death rate, it can depend on age, right? But if it's independent of n, you take this out of the sum and the sum of n times rho n one is simply the rho is this rho from the McKendrick equation. So if, if the birth and death rates are n, uh, uh, dependent, then you have a hierarchy in the in the McKendrick equation. If they're age independent, but can still depend on n, you get a hierarchy in in a birth death master type of uh, master equation type equation. So there's two ways of coming around it, and there's many closure methods that we worked out. And this was related to Robin's question, which I won't get to. This is the fission birth. Suppose now you have a process that can have budding birth and fission birth. Now you need to define uh, these pair particles or quasi particles. Um, these are individual particles because we're looking at a density, right, in age. So now you generate two particles at that precise same age and they deterministically uh, uh, evolve identically. So you have two particles all the time. You cannot describe that with a single uh, particle density type picture. So the, the, anyway. Let me let me just get to the slide where you can look up some references if you're interested in this. Yeah, sorry if we're going over a little bit. Any questions? So this this hierarchy, actually, this closure method for those of you who, who uh, liquid theory people, right? It's a, it's essentially the BBGKY hierarchy. Now, uh, for kinetic theory, there's one main difference, right? It, so, so this problem is, is more difficult in some ways, but much less in others. Kinetic theory, you have the molecular chaos assumption. You have collisions, you have interactions. Here, there's no collisions. I move in age, regardless of how you age, right? You're aging independently from me. My age, my age and your age is not gonna collide in any way, right? So, um, so it's still linear and a non-interacting problem. But because there's no molecular collision, the closure is actually harder. So we have to do it like more mathematically with the with the two different hierarchies. Um, right. so the last part is you know the fun for for more of the theorists, <laughs> um, and the first part is is just you know hopefully any, any, anyone can use it, right? Okay, so you're done, Tom? Yeah, hold on. There's, yeah, I'm done. I'm done. How about extinction? In the presence of noise, is there a possibility that the population hits zero? Is that possible? Uh, only in the discrete. It doesn't hit zero in the, everything is exponential. The the, the ODE, the, sorry, the PDE uh, deterministic McKendrick equation, technically it doesn't hit zero, yeah. Okay, I, I think, yeah, thank you. Uh, there are a lot of questions I think people um, or let people to ask. So before this, I want to um, first of all, uh, thank uh, Tom for this uh, uh, introduction, uh, for this uh, theoretical basis. So I think, you know, as Robin just pointed out, right, this is the, you know, if people with... Uh, oh, sorry, Pete, Pete has a question. Pete has a question. I missed Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I'll let them ask. Uh, oh, you know, okay, okay, okay. Let okay. me make a summary. Uh, okay. uh, sorry, I see. 
So I think, you know, as Robin uh, pointed out, this is a, the theoretical formalism. We already, you know, people with a theoretical background will see it in, in liquid theory or those things. Um, and then we can apply to, to biological system. Like in, my, in a recent review paper I wrote for phytobiology, I said to talk about similar thing for, for cell state transitions. And then this morning I just told my